The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Hi, I'm Eileen Cavanaugh from the Hennepin County Library Program Office. My guest today is Marsha Muller, author of Where Echoes Live and many other mystery series and mystery books. Welcome, Marsha. Thank you. I'm really glad to have you with us today because I'm a fan of Sharon McCone, and most of your books have been written about the Sharon McCone series. And there's a new one for your other fans, Where Echoes Live. How would you describe this book to people who have not met Sharon McCone before? Mm. Well, Where Echoes Live is set in a very odd area of California, the high desert country near the Nevada border. And Sharon is a private detective with a law co-op in San Francisco who's been called up there to assist some environmentalists having problems, very strange things going on. And uh, the book concerns environmental issues, uh, history, historical issues. It's interesting, I thought, that the book has an environmental theme. Is this uh, a new trend in mystery series or it, does it just more reflect the time in which the book was written? I think a lot of mystery authors are starting to see the mystery as a great way to get their message across, whatever that might be. I like to concern myself with social issues, things that are particular concern to me. So your current social issue was the environment. Well, this is one that has always been of concern to me, and also the historical issue, the preservation of the past. And, and there's Ghost Town in Where Echoes yes. Live that was part of the preservation element. Yes. It's, it, the whole uh, setting is actually based on a real setting, which I took and picked up and moved further up into the Sierras. And um, the Ghost Town does actually exist. And it's threatened by a large-scale commercial mining o uh, operation, which is going to come in, and besides poisoning the groundwater and the air, it's likely to cause the buildings in the ghost town to collapse from blasting. Uh -huh. So this book is real and it's not real. Yes, it's, uh, a lot of times I'll do that. It, it's wonderful, you know, to have that power to pick up a whole town and a lake and a ghost town and just move them around. But yet you've stayed rather close uh, in most of your books to your your own uh, area in which you've lived, is this just a sensible matter of comfort or? San Francisco fascinates me because of the diversity of the population, the geography, uh, the ethnic groups, and it's a wonderful city to explore. The middle half of this book takes place in San Francisco and explores several different areas. Mm -hmm. So it, geographically, it's far flung. And part of the social issue, too, is that uh, Sharon McCone is the, the head investigator for All Souls Legal Cooperative, which serves clients who could not ordinarily afford the going legal rate. That's right. They're kind of an offshoot of the 1970s poverty wars, law wars, when a lot of young people just out of law school banded together and formed these co-ops in order to help people who couldn't afford good legal aid. All Souls is growing up, unfortunately. They have to come into the 90s, and the people there are dealing with a lot of ambivalence about wearing their three-piece suits and driving good cars and actually getting fees. They are even getting an 800 number in the next book. They are. The trend is yes, moving into forward. the future. <laughs> but that's another interesting aspect, I think, of uh, Sharon McCone is, and of other female detectives, too, is that they usually drive kind of junky cars. <laughs> yes. Sharon finally had the engine 
on her MG fixed. I just didn't think people were going to believe that thing could still run. In fact, a lot of people would come up at signings and say, why don't you get her a new car? <laughs> but she's left the outside kind of scabrous because it's not good to be too conspicuous. Well, and, and that brings up another uh, point that, that it seems as if readers uh, feel that this is a real person she's taken oh, yeah. on a it, real meaning for them. It's really good to see. It makes me feel that I've done my job well. It, it's just so funny. People are always asking about the love life. That, that's the most interesting thing, it seems, and giving me advice on which boyfriend should go, which should stay, or get her back together with so-and-so, or get rid of this one. Do you use advice that people either tell you verbally or write to you? A lot of times it will tip me to what people like in the series and what bothers them and also things that I may not be doing quite right. Uh, recently at a library association meeting, a young woman came up to me and said, well, I really liked this one book, but I didn't like the fact that she drank all that wine and then got in her car and drove. And I thought, well, that's right. It's setting a bad example. Now, I know this is fiction. She's not going to go out and run into anyone and hurt them, but it also should reflect reality, and she would not do that. And that's hard because you've created a vision of this particular character as a, a lover of white wine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and as many of the, quote, hard-boiled female detectives, uh, they like to drink a little. Mm -hmm. And so it, you're right, it's hard to... She uh, has to limit herself yeah. now. Or have a cup of coffee. Yes, yes, she's getting very tired of coffee. <laughs> Uh, what kind of research did you do for Where Echoes Live? Because there are various aspects, like the environment, mm -hmm. the ghost town. Um, there are other things, like the whole trend in the real estate development, mm -hmm. and the hotel and the resort industry. Did you know all that? Or? The trend in the real estate market and the trend in the Asian development of business in San Francisco has really been on the news a lot lately. In fact, there were several TV specials on it, which I was able to tape and watch in detail to kind of get the feel for the people involved. I had to do a lot of research into commercial mining, both the old kind, modern day, and also the prospectors who are out there in the riverbeds with their various prospecting gear. Of course, because both aspects show up in the, uh, yeah. uh, in the oh, which points out an interesting fact that not all research is being done in libraries any longer. It's TV oh gosh, shows no, it's TV shows, and you know you can ask people. People who are experts in a field are always so pleased to just volunteer their expertise if you tell them you're writing a book in that area. So the sources that a writer can draw from are really incredible. And I didn't think about the simple source of respo writer response, reader response mm -hmm. uh, uh, to your character. Yeah. Uh, someone has said that your characters are real, believable people. Where do you find your models? They're not really modeled on actual people. People are so complex, it would be very hard, I think, to model a character totally on one individual. But there are bits and pieces of people I've known that may be starting points for the whole character. And when I start writing a character, they just develop on their own. I watch them interact on the page. I know how they relate to one another. Who they are just comes out of the writing. How do you keep them all straight? Well, sometimes I don't, unfortunately. <laughs> People will ask me about so-and-so in a book I've written five years before that they read yesterday, and it's embarrassing because I might have forgotten them. I had a funny experience with Sharon's mother appears in this book and comes to town for a visit. I was writing along, and I wanted her to tell someone to call her by her first name, and I'd forgotten her first name. I tore through my files, there's nothing in there, and I thought, I'm not going to reread every single book. I refuse to do this, it's too humbling. So I asked a reader. Interesting. And the reader looked through and said, no, you never named her, so give her whatever name you want. 
Interesting. So, so you don't have a cross-reference spot out. I do now. After that <laughs> scare, <laughs> I've started one. Do you feel as if you really know Sharon McCone? Is she a friend of yours? Oh, yeah. You know when you had imaginary playmates? That's a lot of what the feeling is. She's, she's me, but she's not me. She's an idealized version. Taller, braver, skinnier. Is she a, a grown-up imaginary friend? Yes, very much so. So that perhaps we shouldn't discourage children from having I don't imaginary think so. friends. Did you have imaginary friends? Yes, I did. I, I lived a long way from the grade school, and there weren't many other kids in our neighborhood. And so I'd walk home with my imaginary friend, talking to her and probably looking a little demented. And look how, how well it's paid off for you. I think that having friends like that encourages creativity in children. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. live in the imagination. I don't know a writer who didn't have someone like that in their childhood. Interesting. Do you wake up at night uh, thinking about or do you dream about her? A lot of times if I'm having a problem with the book, if I'm plotting it and there's a point that's not quite working or I don't know quite where I'm going from there, if I think about it before I go to sleep, the subconscious is wonderful. I'll wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night and the answer will be there. We're always working. Night and day, mm -hmm. night and day. Uh, do you keep a journal? No, I don't. Never have. I always thought I should. Well, that's perhaps why you shouldn't if it's a should kind of that's thing. That's probably why I didn't. I know that many author, many writers feel it's an important uh, yeah. Uh, I think it can be very useful. How did you come across Hank Zahn, whom I think runs through most of the Sharon McCone books? Hank is a little bit of my brother, whose name is also Hank, and who is also an attorney. He, Does he know that? He didn't see the resemblance, but his wife picked up on it right away. A lot of people don't see themselves if a character is patterned even a little bit on them. They, they just don't recognize themselves, mm -hmm. which is good if you happen to be getting even with someone who's <laughs> not in your favor. Wasn't it uh, um, uh, Sue Grafton who said that her first book was written yes. from some kind of desire <laughs> yes. to kill her husband? <laughs> her yes, former her husband, former husband yes. was very well taken care of in yes. that book. So I think you've said, or someone has said about you, that part of Sharon McCone is uh, things that you would like to do but mm -hmm. really wouldn't do in your real life. Yes, she's so much braver than I am, and she, she has such an interesting life. Writers do not have tremendously interesting lives except when we get out like I have been. Behind the typewriter is not the place where much happens. Many writers say it is an isolated life. Is that true even for mystery writers? Very much so. And I'm fortunate to have a lot of friends in the field, and people who live close by, whom I can talk it over with. Do you belong to groups like Sisters in Crime? That, that I don't uh, belong to groups simply because I tend to get too involved in them, and I'd end up not having a life. So. That's been one thing I've had to say, okay, but I really do support what they're doing for writers. It's wonderful. Well, and many writers say they get involved in so many things they suddenly are not writers anymore. That's the trouble. You can get carried away with it, and suddenly it's two years since your last book and your mm -hmm. editor's hollering at you. Have all your books been published by uh, Mysterious Press? No, the last five have. How did, how did you move over to them as a press? Actually, my editor from Walker and Company, for whom I had done another series, was hired as an editor there. And she called up my agent and said, do you think she'd want to come work for me again? And it's been a great relationship. So it's a good editor is uh, of, of more primary importance than a, a particular publisher. Oh, yes. It's someone who understands your work and can see those things that maybe you're not seeing because you're so close to it. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate I have my editor, Sarah Ann Freed, at Mysterious, and then I have Bill Pranzini at home who reads all my stuff before it even goes into them. So I've got two great editors there. You are lucky then. Yes, I'm yes. very lucky.
And you have done some mysteries with Bill Ponzi. We've done three together. Two in series books and one straight suspense novel, as well as about ten, I think ten anthologies of short stories and one monster five-pound work on the detective genre. That's A Thousand and One Midnight? Yes, yes. I weighed it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a, a tome. Yes. Um, how does it work working with another author? It's great if you're working with someone you trust and who approaches the work the same way you do. We had very few problems. It's great to be able to share the problems and share the plotting, work it out with someone else. It's not nearly as lonely. Of course, when you're standing toe to toe, almost coming to blows over something, you begin to regret ever getting into it. I was going to say, no fights about how we say this? Or? Oh, well, a few. <laughs> but you work those things out. And, and it sounds challenging and stimulating, too, to have someone to bounce yeah. ideas off of. It's a great change of pace, uh -huh. too. Uh -huh. uh, I want to get back to Sharon because uh, I was intrigued by the fact that she seems, as well as other of the new breed of uh, female detectives, seems to have a new relationship with almost <laughs> every book. Is this because she is, uh, by personality, an uncommitted woman, or is it an occupational hazard? I think it's a little of both. She's leery about becoming committed in a permanent way. But also, it's very hard to find a man who's secure enough in himself that he can deal with a woman who is never home or home at very odd times, who often is in danger, who gets out her gun and takes that off to work with her. It's not that easy to come up with a character who mm -hmm. is a good match, and I've had a lot of difficulty finding somebody. I think I may have. I was going to say, in this book, Where Echoes Live, Hi Rapinski always refers to her as Macomb. Mm -hmm. is it, and is this to indicate that they are of more of an equal? Uh, I think it's just the way he would talk to her. It's it. I never really thought about why he did that. It was just came out in the writing, and he continues to do it. Interesting that 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 this sort of emerged without any conscious thought on your. I think the subconscious plays a tremendous part in how our characters evolve. If you let it, but that's that's mm -hmm. a, an author's skill too. I presume that you have to be willing to sort of be open to that kind of thing. And you have to be not afraid to just let go and to let things remain very fluid. And it, it can get scary. I don't plot with an outline, and I don't really know when I begin a book or even when I'm halfway through exactly where it's going. Sometimes it's pretty scary when I'm sitting at the halfway point and thinking, well, did I write myself into a corner? Am I going to be able to detect my way out of here a few steps ahead of her. So do you know the ending of the story before you start? No. Very often not. And sometimes that will change right up to the very last writing on it. In The Shape of Dread, I had a final scene where the two bad guys and Sharon and another witness are all in a room. and talking and it's about to be revealed that this one is the bad guy and I looked around that room and over here is the guy who really did it. And it was one of those heart-stopping moments at the typewriter. Well, wait a minute, this is what really happened. The real motivation, I had built it in, again subconsciously, and I just wasn't recognizing what I had. So the suspense was yours as well as the reader's? I was real surprised. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's that's. Uh, that's it's wonderful if it works. Out. I'm waiting for the day when it doesn't. Well, that can always be put aside as a yes. <laughs> as a later development. Um, Sharon is one eighth Cherokee Indian. Shoshone. Shoshone. Okay. Uh, is this a, a multicultural theme, or is this another thing that emerged as you? Well, that was more deliberate and. 
sometimes I really wonder if I should have done that. In an early manuscript, which was never published, that was a clue. She had told someone something about that, and the killer knew it, so obviously the, it was one of these terribly convoluted things with somebody masquerading as somebody else. And I never dropped it. Now I, I tend to forget about it sometimes, and she'll be talking to someone who's a Native American who's obviously going to comment about the way she looks, and I'll have to go back and put it in because I don't think about it. She doesn't think about her heritage mm -hmm. very much, mm -hmm. and it's one of the things she feels sad about, that we aren't more connected to our roots. Did when you thought of this character and the series, did you have to sit down and write sort of a resume of this person to get started yeah, on Yeah, I was in a writer's workshop, and that was one of the first things the woman who led it, who was a published author, told us to do, was to sit down and write down everything you could think of about the character. You know, likes, dislikes, favorite subjects in grade school, high school, everything. And I still have that. I don't refer back to it much, and I think I'd find a few surprises mm -hmm. if I did, but it's good to have that grounding. Even if all this information is not used? In you still need to know it, to know who a person is. I think there's a growth, too, in uh, the character, when I, after I finished reading Where Echoes Live, I went back to read Edwin of the Iron oh, Shoes, which is the very that's first one. a real difference. And although I had read it years yeah. ago, I, I thought when I looked at it that she seemed more naive than she did. Oh, she was. She really was. And I, I think that it's typical, it's what would happen to a person in light of the kinds of experiences she's had. You, you become more cynical. You are less willing to trust, less willing to take people at face value. And she's just grown up. She was around 30 then. And in between there, she had to kill someone, yes. right? Yes, yes. A, a, a self-defense kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, but, and typical of probably female detectives, it seems as if it's much harder for them to do even in self-defense and they take mm -hmm. a longer time getting over that trauma. Than it was hard to get meal. over and she's also come recently up against the realization that she has wanted to kill people uh -huh. a couple of times. That's even harder to accept the killing she can justify because it was to save a friend it had to be done. But this, facing that rage within yourself is a very difficult thing. So there's uh, a sort of psychological development of this character yeah. too. Do you have do you have help from a psychologist in developing? No, I just feel my way. It's it's how I think I would react mm -hmm. under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I I think it's real important to have that psychological development, not only to interest the readers but to make the series grow and change mm -hmm. so I can keep my interest in it. Well, I think that's probably why people say that you have believable characters, because people have these, uh, they're, they aren't all good, or they have these strains of, uh, of threads in their yeah. personality that one might not think of on the surface, so you've gone below the surface. Well, this is the way we are, and it, it's more fun to portray. I, I can't write anything all that static, because I'm easily bored. Uh, the the female private eye, especially as illustrated in your books and in uh, 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 Sue Grafton and uh, Sarah Paretsky, mm -hmm. are much different than the earlier female detectives who were portrayed by male writers. Oh, yeah. Did you did you consciously set up to, out to develop a more believable woman detective, or is it? merely because you were a woman writing about women? It's a little of both. I had read some of those earlier attempts, and these were not likable people. I wouldn't want any of them in my house. They were basically attempts I, on the parts of the writers to exploit the women's movement. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of them really took the time to say what would a woman be like in this field. They were female men. Yes, 
essentially they were clones of the mm -hmm. male the and the very typical male detective of years back rather than the way the male private eye has also evolved these days but uh, Sharon is female simply because I it had never occurred to me right from a male viewpoint this is what I know Sharon and other female detectives too that have come along since you developed your character seems to have a well-developed sense of morality at least in her own lights and uh, I guess that's typified by her being part of the All Souls uh, mm -hmm. Cooperative. So does that fall in with the social issues or is th does, does that just develop as a part of her personality? It's very much a part of her personality. It, it's her personality that would make her work for a co-op like that. They also, a lot of the female detectives, if not all that I have read, have not a lot of money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't yuppies. No. No, it just didn't seem that, again, she took on her own personality and she was not going to have anything to do with that. And of course, you never get rich working for a legal services plan. It's true. What's next? What's next? What's number oh. 13? Is there going to be a number 13 yes. or will it be 14? Number, oh yeah, there has to be a number 13. <laughs> it's my lucky number, actually. It's called Pennies in a Dead Woman's Eyes, and it should be published about a year from this coming fall, provided I finish it. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia, for you. being with us today. It's been a pleasure. A presentation of the Hennepin County Library.